Hey, this is Meredith Elliott Powell, and that's right, it is one o'clock Eastern and time for Thrive, turning uncertainty into competitive advantage. The show where we dive into the strategies, discuss the steps, everything that you need to know to start to control change rather than have change control you. Listen, you are going to want to hang out for today's show because I have the Kendra Lee with us today really talking about everything that you need to know about marketing and sales. And I love the fact that we're going to be talking about both of these together. So Kendra, I want you to um, take a breath. I'm going to hit this video because we're going to come back and I'm going to ask you a lot of questions to give a lot of detail about your expertise in today's marketplace. Sound good? I am looking forward to it, Meredith. <laughs> All right, let's rock and roll. Now, hey, Kendra, I am really excited to have you on the show today. You know, I have followed your work for a long time, but I got to say, until I saw your intro, I did not know these things um, about you. And, and I love the fact that your intro includes this because I think that a lot of people listening are going to take a lot of comfort in your background. And if you can accomplish what you've accomplished in sales. Um, so get ready, audience. Here we go. Despite starting her sales career in accounting, the very antithesis of, um, of sales, failing IBM's entry level sales exam. I love that because I've always felt those sales exams are so wrong and being told she couldn't sell without an engineering background. Kendra Lee entered sales and proved everyone naysayers. She turned her knowledge to numbers into a lead generation approach that propelled her to the top 1% of sales professionals. She founded KLA Group, wrote two books, and is here with us today. Super excited to have you, but I got to dive into that background a little bit. Why were you even attracted to sales? You know, I actually loved the accounting piece, but... Believe it or not, I felt like I could do something more. I didn't know what the more was. And I had this sales engineer who walked by and he said, you know, you should get into sales. And I was like, what? What are you talking <laughs> about? I should get into sales. Where does that even come from? I'm sitting here in accounting. And he said, there's just something about you. I think you would be successful. And it just kind of sat there, not even really knowing what it meant, but I just felt like there was more to the world than just doing numbers. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you know what I really love about it is the fact that um, I came from it from the opposite direction. So I came into the world of sales and I didn't understand the numbers. And luckily for me, I had um, two companies I worked for where the CFO in both companies were interested in learning sales and they taught me the numbers. And I don't know if you found this in your career, but one of the biggest problems in organizations is the accounting department and the sales department are as far away from one another as they should be. And the truth is they should be wrapped together. They absolutely should. And as a salesperson, I think the reason I was so successful is I did understand the numbers and I understood how to have a business conversation because here I was presenting to business executives, all the numbers and why they were investing, what they were investing in and how much it costs and answering all their questions, which is usually one of the core things that salespeople shy away from. They don't mm -hmm. want to talk the numbers and they won't have the strategic business conversations. So if you can get the two together, it just makes such a stronger sales person as well as a stronger sales organization. Uh, absolutely. So, so there you are, the sales engineer comes around and says, you should get into sales. So you take the exam, you fail. Did you have to work to get them to allow you to have a chance to sell? Because a lot of times when you fail those sales exams, they won't let you move forward. Boy, you know, it's kind of interesting. I was in the right place at the right time. So failed the exam. Sorry, <laughs> sales is not going to be for you. You won't be successful. Go back to accounting. So back to accounting, I went, right? I was still in my role. They, Yay that they let me even take it and take a chance. But then what happened is 
corporate decided they had way too many people in corporate positions. Mm -hmm. And what they didn't have enough of was salespeople. And so if you think about it now as a business owner, I'm going, this is brilliant. Yeah. They decided that they'd make sales an available career to anybody who wanted to raise their hand and take a chance at it. The only caveat was if you were not successful, there would not be another position for you. Wow. So no golden parachute. No, here you go. We'll pay you to leave. Instead, we're going to let you go try your hand at sales. And if you're not successful, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> So obviously you, obviously you made, um, you made the transition and were you immediately successful? Was it a struggle? The first year. So you'll laugh even further. Accountant, where would you expect me to go? Farming, account management, you right. know, something like that. No, I wanted to be new business development. <laughs> okay. So when my manager and the sales team said, you know, we're thinking of making you a, an account manager. I was like, no, I like working with all the new people trying to figure out what the heck they want to do and how it's going to help their business. Again, makes total sense because here I was understanding all the numbers and what goes on and how, what are the next steps you need to take in your business. Um, so they put me in a new business development territory, but the first year Meredith, it was grueling. And I mm -hmm. tell salespeople this, the first year in any new business development territory, it's all about building. Right. And if you do all the right things for that first year, in your second year, you will be wildly successful. So the first year, I made my number by the skin of my teeth in the last few days of December. Just, <laughs> just, it was awful. And I just, I woke up and said, okay, this is too hard. I am not doing this again. And that's when I stepped back and I said, all right, what worked, what didn't and change the whole strategy for the next year. And the next year I made my number in June. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's talk about, let's talk about sales today as you're out there working, you know, it is people, it is difficult for people in the first year, but you know, once COVID happened for a lot of people, it yeah. was like the first year, right? All because, over again. you know, one thing that I find so fascinating about sales is that, um, you think of us as innovative, cutting edge people, but we're one of the slowest industries to change. I mean, just look yes. at how many people had never sold virtually when COVID hit. So what are some of the biggest challenges you see out there right now as you're working with, um, with clients? I think the biggest one is people are getting wrapped up in it's a pandemic. It's hard to reach people. Therefore, I won't be successful because I'm, I'm still very focused in new business development. You know, if you can get in the door and you can start having the conversations and you get the relationship started, usually that's when your sales skills will kick in. And yes, if you've got good consultative selling skills and relationship skills, you'll be successful. It's how do I get the leads? How mm -hmm. do I reach the people? Even if I'm in account management and I'm trying to grow my account base, I still have to get in the door with new and different people. And people are getting so wrapped up in, but I can't go out on site or they won't let me in or now they're all used to being virtual or their, their phone numbers have all changed. They're all working from home, so I can't reach them. How is that any different than when we were doing prospecting pre-COVID <laughs> when we didn't know what their phone numbers were, what their emails were, who the right person was or how to get past a gatekeeper if there was a gatekeeper because most of the time it was just voicemail. Right. They're just... They're wrapped up in a new name for the same problem we've always had that we all had to figure out how to get around. So does it begin with mindset if you're working with a, with a group of people? Where do you start to get them? You know, it, it is sort of a, um, you know, it is sort of a who moved my cheese complex, right? I mean, you know, it's that, uh, it's that it's the same old problem, but we're, you know, we keep going back to the same. I always tell people that the biggest thing I see, people are using the same strategies for a problem that has changed a bit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it starts in prospecting back at the beginning of looking at the target markets and figuring out, are we targeting the right people with in the right businesses who have the problems that we can solve? So for some people, their target markets absolutely shifted. You know, if you were in hospitality, that changed radically. 
So it's going back to the beginning and looking and seeing, all right, are we in the right target markets? But now what are the problems that they actually have? Mm -hmm. Because while we may solve a certain problem, how it needs to be talked about or how it has changed, they need to know. So it takes going back and looking at, am I using the right messages? Am I targeting the right types of people? Have the size companies I need to work with shifted? You know, I look in our own business where, as you mentioned, we work with both sales and marketing, where we run lead generation for clients, where we actually help them figure out what their marketing strategy should be. And we're doing their email campaigns and developing their websites. We were really busy during 2020 when a lot of people weren't because they were all trying to figure out how the heck do I market now? Right. And then we saw a whole bunch of roll-ups in a lot of the industries we serve in 2021. Okay. So we had to step back and say, okay, what's shifting for our clients? Cause they're going through all these roll-ups and how do they have to change what they're doing because they are shifting their own businesses. And oh, by the way, are their clients going through the same thing? Because a lot of people had a reality crisis. Am I going to stay in business? Right. Or am I not? Right. <laughs> so, you know, I find it so interesting and that you do marketing and sales. And, you know, we've talked for years about the alignment between marketing and sales. But again, you go into most organizations and there's no alignment between marketing um, and sales. And what it reminds me of is for years, we talked about relationship selling and you could still sell without having a relationship. And before COVID, we talked about marketing and sales and you could still sell without marketing. In today's marketplace, you can't sell without marketing or you have made it so difficult um, for yourself. So talk a little bit about when you sort of had that aha moment and what you really mean with getting marketing and sales together and aligned and, and, I, and I assume working together. Well, and it's not just that you can't be in sales and not work with marketing. You can't be in marketing and not work with sales. Yeah. So for us, our shift, we started all in sales and training people how to do new business development. And it shifted with the advent of all the marketing automation, which now in sales, if you're working with marketing, you've got sales sequences that marketing wrote for you. You've got marketing campaigns. They're out driving leads for you to follow up on. Marketing really is your front end engine to get you some inbound or warm leads. Well, when we made that shift, when it moved out of sales to where marketing was so important and said, wait a minute, everything we teach sales reps how to do is now done over in marketing. <laughs> so right. we started working with marketing, but what we discovered is you pass a lead and then it's still like prospecting. Sales has to know how to follow up on it. And marketing has to understand how sales is following up so that the, whatever they're writing or delivering is delivered in a way that sales can easily follow up on it. And then if the lead doesn't go anywhere, they don't respond, if sales isn't having success, marketing needs to understand, well, where do we need to shift? And sales needs to look and say, well, what do we need to guide marketing to do differently? So if they're not working hand in hand, all that's happening is leads are being passed. Right. And you hear the same old thing. Oh, we get just bad leads. And sales doesn't follow up. And marketing says, yeah, well, we pass leads and sales doesn't know how to follow up. <laughs> you have to have that marriage. And when you do, the results are just phenomenal because they're teamed so closely together. Why is there such a rift? between the two. I mean, you know, it's rare that you go into the organization and, and the teams are well aligned and, and really working together. Even I was just working with a client the other day and um, and, the, and they get along, but there is no fundamental understanding or integration of what one does. So even if you don't have the animosity, which is a huge positive step, there's still usually not a deep, intimate first understanding and then integration of the two. Why do you think that is? 
I I think that marketing doesn't understand how sales moves a prospect through the sales cycle mm-hmm. and how what they're doing can be used by sales. So they can't articulate wow, we just wrote this phenomenal white paper. We just shot this video series. We just did this um, video out on LinkedIn, wherever they're doing it. They can't articulate to sales. We just did this. Here's how you can use it in the sales process because they don't understand the sales process. Mm -hmm. And likewise, sales doesn't understand how to use it. So sales needs to be educated in all the great content and all the activities, how that helps them and how do they use it? I mean, we create sales sequences for clients. We work with clients that are between a million and 85 million in annual revenue. So they have small marketing team, small sales teams. They're closely aligned, but sales doesn't, when when we create something cool like that, sales doesn't know how to use a sales sequence mm. unless somebody has taught them. And it's marketing that really shows them how to do it. But before marketing can show it and before they can create something that's of value, they have to understand what sales is doing, what their actual process is, so that when we've delivered a proposal, they know what the sales sequence needs to look like or we're in the middle of requirements gathering, they know how sales would benefit from having a sales sequence that could keep things alive while they're working behind the scenes. So it's, to me, it's training on both sides. Yeah, a, a, a good understanding of that. So I wanna, I wanna switch gears and I wanna talk, wanna talk a little bit um, about your book, The Sales Magnet, how to get more customers without cold calling. I mean, that title right there is is so attractive because I can really count on one hand the number of salespeople I've known in my life who really love to cold call. Mm -hmm. Salespeople will do it, but you know, I think given a choice, we would much prefer to do to do the um, to do the warm call. So tell us sort of about the the background of the book, some of the premise of the book, and why you passionately believe that um, you can get more customers without cold calling. The premise of the book goes all the way back to being an accountant. I wanted to go into new business development, but really did not like to cold call. Because what do you say? I mean, we now teach people how to cold call, but I'd much prefer to call somebody who's warm yes. than somebody who's cold. So it, it goes all the way back to that and recognizing that as salespeople, like you said, there are very few that just want to dial all the time. And so it's how can we warm up a group of people before we call so that when we call, there's a higher likelihood they will take our call or they will connect with us on LinkedIn or we can email them, but they'll respond in some way to us. And so it's all the strategies that you can use to get their attention before you actually reach out to them. So give us some of your, um, give us some of your favorites. My favorites are the email campaigns. And I know, yes, we've been doing them, but email is still the easiest thing for people to respond to. I I prefer it. I I mean, I love it. Text, I feel like I have to respond right away. So it gives me anxiety. Mm -hmm. A voice message, I may take three days to listen to it, but I love email because I could do it at nine o'clock at night. I feel like I'm on my time. Well, and with text, I want to have warmed them up somehow. So this is all about how do I get them warm before I reach out? So if I've gotten them warm and then they've responded, yeah, text is fine, right? Because I've already got them. But if I don't have them yet, I want something that's going to get their attention. So email and LinkedIn, which I'm sure your your people, your listeners all use. I also, you'll laugh, I like things like Twitter, Mm -hmm. Twitter. Instagram, you can use all these different social mediums to be seen and to talk in a way that raises that visibility. Um, Anything that you can do to a larger group of people who are your prospects that you want to target, 
-hmm. and get their attention and then see who responds. So go after that group of people. That's my very favorite strategy. Pick one way that you're going to approach all of them because they're similar. So they have a similar business issue that you're approaching them with. And then use your different strategies like email, LinkedIn, and video to reach them. Is, um, is, will, does cold calling work in today's environment? Absolutely. It does. Absolutely. I, I know a lot of people say, oh, you can't. There's the pandemic. We can't reach people, but it does. So we need to surround it with other activities, but we cannot ignore it. So I may lead with an email, a LinkedIn connection. I may send a video. I may have them on a newsletter list, depending on who you are. And then I'm going to absolutely pick up the phone and call those people who are paying attention. And that's where your marketing automation comes into play. Because I you can that. pay attention to who's doing what. I love that. Call those people who are paying attention. Exactly. I'm not going to call the people who haven't yet because right. they haven't gotten me. But if marketing automation shows me people who have opened, who have clicked, or they've connected with me on LinkedIn, it's a warm call now. It's not a cold call. Right, right. Well, it is hard to believe, but we are coming to the end of this show. And I always finish with two questions. Um, okay. You can answer them in either in uh, either order. One is super easy. How do people find out about you? Find out about the sales magnet and how they can get more customers without cold calling follow you, learn more about your trainings and things. The other is what is your biggest and best piece of advice for professionals looking to thrive in an uncertain marketplace? Okay. So let's start with the contact information. Great. You go to our website, klagroup.com and connect there or on LinkedIn or shoot me an email at kendra.lee at klagroup.com. So I just All gave right. you three different ways we can connect. And we'll make sure we have those in the show notes. Perfect. And then the biggest piece of advice I would have is don't let all of the shifts that have gone on get into your head and keep you from selling or believing that you can be successful. Just this morning, I was speaking with someone who said, everybody on my team is poised to make their number by June, their wow. annual number. And he said, I'm not, I'm doing something wrong. What the heck is it? So people are buying and you can be successful. Don't let that get in your head. I think, I think that is, um, I think that is so true. I just, I'm just reading right now, um, uh, Dan Sullivan, strategic uh, coach, gap to gain. And it's all about if you focus on literally, if you focus on what you're not doing and what you don't have, you'll get more of that. And if you focus on the progress um, that you make, and I don't know about you, but I'm finding far more businesses that are, that are positioned, even if they're not positioned to do well in this marketplace rather than um, not. And it really does begin with that mindset piece. I absolutely agree. It is having that right mindset. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I loved having you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to wrap up all this information so people can find out more about you and really find out more about uh, The Sales Magnet. Such an important book to read. If you want to fundamentally understand how sales is changing today and what you need to do to be successful. And we'll see all of you right here next week, one o'clock Eastern for another episode of Thrive, turning uncertainty to your competitive advantage. Remember, together we are going to emerge successful. We'll see you next week. Bye.